This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. It's sensitive, personal, and rarely discussed with our loved ones. Managing end-of-life care and hospice on this edition of In Studio. Whether personally or acting as a caregiver for someone we love, we're all likely to be affected by issues surrounding end-of-life care. Decisions can be daunting. Oftentimes, we're not sure which way to turn. On this edition of In Studio, we'll learn about hospice, what it is, how it works, and who has access to hospice services. Our panel of guests bring vast knowledge to all facets of hospice care, from business and clinical operations to spiritual and volunteer roles. Jason Owen is the Southeast Region President for Kindred at Home. Owen has an extensive background in the healthcare field. For over a decade and a half, he has worked for various healthcare related companies in both financial and operational positions. Cheryl Hamilton is the Chief Operating Officer for Covenant Care. Cheryl's considerable resume as a healthcare executive includes being Executive Director of one of the nation's largest hospices. Michelle Carter, is the executive director of Emerald Coast Hospice. She is also a registered nurse who began her hospice, who I should say began as a hospice nurse in 2013. Previously, she had been a surgical nurse working in neurology. Jeff Mislevy has spent the bulk of his career in the healthcare field, much of that time with healthcare organizations in Michigan and Ohio. However, in the fall of 2014, he discovered the Florida sunshine and became president and CEO of Covenant Care Corporation. Coming up a little bit later on in the program, we'll be joined by Angela Bonacini from Covenant Care, Diane Rhodes, who has been a volunteer with both Covenant and Emerald Coast Hospice, and Mark Smith, the spiritual coordinator with Emerald Coast Hospice. So we have a full slate of guests this evening to talk about hospice and end-of-life care. Let me begin just with a very broad question. What is hospice? So hospice is end-of-life care. Um, we take care of patients wherever they're at, their home, um, a facility, um, and just make their last days the best that they can be. A lot of people have a misconception about hospice. They think, oh, well, hospice is coming in. It's, you know, that's the end. And we have patients that have been on service for quite a while. As long as they're showing a decline, they're still eligible for hospice services. So when do you know when to call hospice in? Is it something you do on your own? Is it something your physician does? We wish people would, would um, elect the benefit. I think, um, as Michelle indicated, uh, sometimes it can be uh, very challenging to come to an acceptance that we might be entering into a dying phase. Most of our referrals are generated through healthcare professionals, a physician, uh, a facility that somebody might be residing in. Uh, ultimately, though, a physician needs to certify that an individual has a life expectancy of, of approximately six months or less if the disease were to run its normal course. Um, that's hard to predict. Right. And so um, some people come, uh, unfortunately, most people come too late to service. Um, but we do have patients that live beyond that six month period of time. And um, you know that really can be ideal because it gives us more opportunity to prepare uh, the family to uh, make sure that the uh, patient is very comfortable and that their symptoms are managed and they can really have a, 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 an outcome that they want at the end of life. At, at what point should the family start thinking, well, maybe we need to, we need to call hospice? You know, the, I think the, the travesty in our communities are people don't know what's available to them. A lot of times, and we went through this a couple times in my family, uh, the, the, the caregivers, the sandwich generation, are, are dealing with their parents and they don't know that there's help there. Mm -hmm. um, to your point, a lot of people access hospice too late um, and don't really get the full benefits because in a way, hospice is also there for the families as much as the patient. Um, you know, when, when we have volunteers in the home and, you know, being able to, to talk about stories and, and, and what's going to happen and what to expect and to take some pressure off of the family, take the stress off to have someone at the other end of the phone that can answer questions when something happens in the night, um, to have that person that can bring the meds into the home and you don't have to run around and get them. Um, but you know, I, I, the statistics are, are, are a little, little shocking. Uh, less than a third of the deaths in the United States are actually on hospice. 
um, when you factor out the things that happen in the natural course, um, it's a little surprising that more people don't access the benefit. It is part of the Medicare package. Um, it's a Part A benefit. Um, and like I said, it, it's geared for the last six months of life. It's, it's a bit of a tough thing to nail down, but um, the, the one thing that, that we've seen as we continue to see, see patients across the Emerald Coast is the lack of education that the hospice benefit exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Jeff, why do you think that is? Why do you think fewer people are not, uh, or I should say more people are not accessing hospice? Well, I, yeah, fear is a big part of that. Um, but, you know, I, I guess I would answer that question, too, by backing up a little bit. Uh, it's really never too soon to start thinking about what you want for your care, um, whether you're uh, early in a disease process or, or just planning for your life. You know, the whole concept of advanced care planning is something as a society we struggle with. It's, right. it's not pleasant to think about what might happen to you and what you want to do if it does happen. Um, so, I, you know, I think that fear and that general uncomfortability with the idea that I've got to make some decisions now prevents people from thinking about end-of-life care. Um, but we, we really, we need to encourage people to think about that early uh, and to have some sense of how they want to live out their life uh, even to and through those final days. Speaking of that, and I'll kind of throw this open to the table, at, at what stage in our lives, it, even assuming we're healthy, at what stage in our lives should we sit down and say, you know, I, I want to do some planning with, with, you know, I guess advanced directives and things of that nature. W w when should we do that? Well, as a nurse at the bedside um, with people, um, it's, it's so sad because a lot of times your family is beginning to make those decisions for you when you can't make those decisions for yourself. I mean, I think the earlier you can do it, I mean, if, if, if we would really think about it when we're in our 20s, that would be great, I think. Um, but I think a lot of times, you know, you don't think about death and dying and you don't think about those things. So I think for, for myself, when we got into a situation um, with a, a, we saw somebody in a bad situation and then we made those decisions right then. My husband and I went ahead and, and did our advance planning because I didn't want to be in a, in a situation where I didn't know what I was going to do and I didn't want somebody else making decisions for me. Mm. Um, so I think the earlier the better. Um, the sooner that you can make those decisions, the better. You know, when are you going to write a will? Right. You know, when are you going to do those sorts of things? Um, a lot of times it's on people's deathbeds. Right. And it's hard for those family members to make the decision, what would mom and dad have wanted? Right. So then you've got a, you know, a, you know, a 50 year old child making a decision for their parent and, and maybe they've never even talked about it. They don't know what they want. Right. And those directives would include like, you know, I guess whether to resuscitate and things of that nature. I'll get you guys to expand on what they would include. I think as people start to think about uh, their last will and testament, their their advanced directives, their their you know do not resuscitate. It's all part of the package. It's not just sitting down and, and who you're going to leave your, your your possessions to. It's more about what how you want to direct your health care, where you want to be. Um, and I think also people need to have a firm understanding of what resources they have available to them. Um, and, and talking about the hospice benefit fits into that because it's it's part of the package, like we said. Absolutely. You know. It, um, it's really one of the best gifts that we can give our family is to not put a loved one in a position in a time of crisis mm -hmm. trying to also then make decisions that they may ultimately feel responsible for. Right. And so, um, you know, I would not want to do that to my child or my husband. And so it's important because I also want to make sure that my days go the way I want them to go. And, um, you know, an, another alarming statistic is that um, about half the folks that access the hospice benefit um, live about two weeks uh, yeah. from accessing the hospice benefit. Um, a lot of those individuals do not have advanced directives in place at that time. So not only are we trying to deal with a crisis situation, um, for the family, um, but we're trying to make all those plans in that period of time where really we should be spending that time um, implementing what had already been discussed so right. that everybody has peace of mind. Um, so it, it, it's, it's extremely important to do that when you are healthy. So right. now is the time. And, one and of the, one oh, of the, I'm sorry, Jeff, no, one ahead. of the biggest complaints that, that I hear from family members that we take care of is, I wish we'd known about you sooner. I right. wish you got involved sooner. Um, I, how do we not know this? How do we not know this was available to us? And that's, that's the sad thing because like Cheryl was saying, there's so much that we can do to prepare. 
um, relationships that can be built. Um, we've, we've helped families connect with um, children in jail. I mean, mm -hmm. they can make a phone call. They can have final words with people. But if we get in there those last few weeks, I mean, we're, we're in crisis mode at that point, like you were saying. We're trying to manage pain, manage symptoms, um, get, get things in, in line so the patient dies comfortably. Um, but if we, if we get involved sooner, we can actually um, you know, work through a lot of those things, get all those things ironed out so that those last few days are just sitting around the bedside really prepared for the event and, and family members on board and everybody's said their peace, their goodbyes. Um, and it's, death can be a beautiful thing and I've witnessed it be a beautiful thing. And I've also witnessed it being um, very sad that it happened the way that it did because we just did not get involved quick enough. There's a saying that uh, has been around hospice for a while, which is we add life to days when days no longer can be added to life. And I think that's, that's a really um, targeted um, meaning there when you really consider what happens at the end of life. Uh, we talk so much about relieving pain and suffering. And, and going back to the other question, you know, what, what prevents people from, from engaging this benefit? And some of it is guilt. You know, there's mm. this myth around, you know, giving up. Uh, and, and individuals not wanting to give up because their, their families are counting on them. But the reality is what this also provides, in addition to relieving pain and suffering and anxiety, is an opportunity to have quality interactions with their family members when it, when it matters most. Uh, so really the importance is, um, is around adding that quality of life uh, and, and, and relieving the guilt that people assume will be there, but in reality isn't. Right. You, you said there's, it's never too early to call hospice. Is there a particular age that is off? I mean, is there, are you ever too young, I guess is the question, or is it wide open for everyone? Unfortunately, um, uh, you're never too young. And so uh, we do care for a number of children. Um, you know, the, the beautiful part about being able to care for a child under hospice um, is that, you know, children, uh, can continue to receive any and all treatments um, available to them uh, during that time. Uh, you know, it's very tough for a, a, a parent to say, we're going to stop these particular treatments, that there could be some something that we could do. So um, we do care for a number of children um, from all ages, um, and uh, it's, it's difficult, but I think, you know, um, as Michelle indicated, there's so much we can do for the family members to um, deal with grief uh, and the loss. And then afterward, we have um, uh, really the only organized healthcare benefit that offers bereavement services uh, uh, indefinitely following the death. And, and so we have many services available from one-on-one -on -one to group services. Uh, and those could be extremely beneficial for whether you're, you're losing a child, a spouse, uh, a friend, mm -hmm. uh, we want to make sure that those people are being supported. Yeah. Go ahead. You yeah, well, I was just, I was thinking about the bereavement. Um, you know, we follow for a full 13 months and, and longer if they need us to, um, because a lot of times that's when it gets tough for those families. You know, it's you know, everybody's surrounding them when somebody passes and you have a lot of support and then everybody goes home. Right. And then we get them through that 13 months um, for certain, um, which is every one of the first that they're going to experience without that family member present. So they're gonna have a first Christmas without them there, a first Thanksgiving without them there. You get them through, and then get them through that period of the one year anniversary. Um, and then if they need us to follow them longer, we will. We absolutely will do whatever that family needs for them to feel supported. And it, it, it lets us know that they're okay. They're dealing with their grief appropriately. Um, and, and that's, I think, a beautiful thing that we're able to give to people. Fascinating conversation tonight, not one that we always want to have, but certainly a fascinating conversation talking about end of life issues. We're talking about hospice. We're learning all about it. We are going to continue this discussion in just a couple of moments. I do want to let you know coming up in the second half of our program, we'll be joined by Angela Bonacini, who is with Covenant Care, Diane Rhodes, who's been a volunteer with both Covenant Care and Emerald Coast Hospice, as well as Mark Smith, the spiritual coordinator with Emerald Coast Hospice. You're watching in studio on WSRE television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. We're coming right back. American Graduate is proud to recognize a champion for education. Autism Pensacola is a support group for those living with autism. 
and we seek to improve life for those living with autism. They have given us an opportunity to be part of our son's education, to be part of his playtime. They care about inclusion and acceptance. And our goal, of course, is to increase children's independence and help them be successful in school. We want teachers who are equipped to meet the needs of children with autism in the schools. WSRE has been a great partner with Autism Pensacola, providing us with PBS resources and helping us further our mission. We know that working together as a community, we can improve life for all of those living with autism and have great outcomes. We get to see these kids make such great gains um, in communication and in social skills. So it's so important for families of autism to have this wealth of information as, long, as well as support. And it's so meaningful when um, a parent comes to you and says, you know, this is just what I needed for my son. It's made such a difference in my child's life. The more we do for them as children, the more positive their outcomes will be as adults. Autism Pensacola, helping children and families connect the pieces. For more stories of champions, visit americangraduate.org. You are watching in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. We're discussing hospice and end of life care with Michelle Carter from Emerald Coast Hospice, Jeff Mislevy from Covenant Care, Jason Owen with Kindred at Home, and Cheryl Hamilton also with Covenant Care. Let me ask you about something that I was um, came across, which seems kind of interesting to me, and it looks like it's sort of all somehow tied in with the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, something called Medicare care choices model. What is that? You guys want to take a bite on it? <laughs> I, I absolutely will. Um, came out of the Medicare Center for Innovation, which uh, a lot of great initiatives re recently have. Um, really, it's, it's designed um, to help patients who normally would be excluded from eligibility for the Medicare hospice benefit because of their uh, election to continue to receive curative services. Okay. So things that would prolong your life, whether it's dialysis or chemotherapy. And in what uh, Medicare, I think, rightly has recognized is those individuals would benefit from palliative care as well, uh, even if you're concurrently receiving some of those curative uh, services. So that program really allows providers to provide uh, palliative services in the home uh, while someone continues to receive curative therapies uh, and not be sitting at home waiting to be eligible for a hospice benefit. Because from what I took away from my research was many people would say, well, I don't want to give up on, you know, maybe continuing with chemotherapy or dialysis or whatever the case may be, because like you say, they feel like they are giving up. So it seems to me like it makes a lot of sense, and I sort of got the impression that it ultimately probably saves Medicare money. Is that an accurate assumption? Well, you know, it, it is Medicare's attempt at to deal with everything that we've been talking about this evening is that, uh, you know, the fear of accessing the hospice benefit, the fear of stopping this treatment because it may uh, shorten my life, um, and, and it's the attempt to have a transition period um, and to, for Medicare to pay uh, hospice providers that have been selected to participate in this program uh, as a demonstration to determine is this going to have a positive impact in allowing people to access their benefits earlier and ultimately deal with um, the futility of some care that is being provided at the end of life, to have conversations about the goals of, of this treatment and you know the benefit of the treatment versus the burden of the treatment and ultimately to um, you know allow people to transition away from that care and to elect their full hospice Medicare benefit earlier in the disease process. We, go ahead. I, no, I applaud them for actually going down the road because the, the one thing is, you know, convincing them, okay, you're going to stop this, you're going, you're going to start this. But the reality is when people stop aggressive treatment, sometimes they relax. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they actually get a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a double of a time sometimes documenting decline in the first, you know, few weeks of, of care at times because they're relaxed. Um, this allows them to transition at a slower pace instead of you stop today and, and you start tomorrow. Uh, the, the other piece that a, a lot of companies are working on now, and, and it's one piece that, that I'm focused on throughout the panhandle and, and other places, is really the idea of a palliative care model. Um, it, it, it touches pieces of it, 
But, but what we see in, in healthcare is when, when people have exacerbations or, or people don't have a contact, but they don't quite qualify for hospice yet, what do you do? Mm -hmm. You know, those are, the, those are the folks that end up in the ERs. Those are the ones that end up with exacerbations that, that, that lead to, to other procedures that they probably don't need nor want. Um, so I think there's a lot of different programs we're looking at to try to fit that need. Uh, but taking care of seniors in place is, is, is really the idea. When we talk about palliative care, let me get you guys to sort of explain what we're talking about. I would say palliative care um, is when you're trying to keep people comfortable. Um, you, there, there are many, many things that, that go into that. So we, we, we talk in hospice all the time about palliative care where we treat people. Um, now there's a palliative care program where you get more aggressive treatment um, like chemotherapy, dialysis. Um, but palliation a lot of times is just keeping people comfortable, giving them um, what they need to manage their symptoms um, at home. Now, you can probably speak more, speak more to the palliative care model that you have. Um, we're rolling ours out soon um, where people can continue to go on and get um, more aggressive treatment. You know, like, like I told you before, the, the people that say, oh my goodness, I just wish I had known sooner. I wish I had this sooner. A lot of times it's because these people have continued on with chemotherapy, dialysis, right up until the very last moment because that's, that's their lifeline. When they make that decision, um, I, I had the, the pleasure of taking care of a man who was 50 years old, teenage children, um, and his, his wife, we got called in the last 10 days mm -hmm. of his life. And you know, his wife said to me, I just wish I'd known. We went through all of this physical therapy, all of this, um, this chemo. We, we were still struggling it, you know, right at Christmas time, trying mm -hmm. to do all these things that we needed to do um, to continue on and, and be appropriate. And, and then finally, I think she's the one who said, what about hospice? Right. And um, you know, her doc's like, well, you can try that. I mean, if you wanna do that, I mean, and, and her husband was struggling. He didn't wanna give up. He didn't wanna give up on his children. So when you have um, palliative care, we could get involved sooner with that family. And I think probably set some goals for them um, you know, what, are, what do you want to obtain with this? You know, are, is the chemo working? Um, you know, how are you feeling after dialysis? How, how much further along are you getting with this? Because a lot of times it is a losing battle that they're fighting and a lot of physicians don't want to have that conversation with them. They don't want to tell them we're done here. If there's even a glimmer, even if it's ever so slight, um, they're not going to oftentimes have those tough conversations with them. Um, and I think I, I think palliative care is helpful in that we could get involved sooner um, and they could begin to transition over um, to hospice services. There's a key word in the Medicare care choices model, which is choices. Mm -hmm. uh, much of hospice is about having a choice. It's about mm -hmm. making decisions uh, about your care when some aspects of your care you have no control over. Uh, so the Medicare Care Choices model, I think, is um, you know illuminating some of the the greater choices you have with palliative care. You can decide what level of comfort you want to have, what level of pain and symptom management you want to have, and in the case of palliative care, you have some control over how long you want to receive that type of care before maybe transitioning to hospice care. So I think the fact that uh, it extends the choice to patients and families is really important. Speaking of how this is covered, we've talked about Medicare, and, and uh, many people may not realize that hospice does fall under Medicare, I guess Medicaid and insurance. Elaborate. Go ahead. No, I, um, you know, I, I think that's unfortunately the best kept secret. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, generally when I first talk to folks about hospice and their hospice benefit, I always kind of like to start with that this is a 100% paid for benefit. Um, and, and then people, you know, it, it can kind of listen to what this is all about. Um, but it is something that folks are entitled to under their Medicare benefit. They are entitled to it as long as they continue to meet eligibility. There's no cutoff. There's no copay. Um, and so um, Medicaid also has a similar program in place. Most insurance companies as well mirror the hospice uh, Medicare and Medicaid benefit. And as hospice providers, we uh, take individuals regardless of their ability to pay. Uh, and so if, if those benefits are not uh, available to them, uh, we do not discriminate um, related to um, 
payment or, or no payment regardless from an admission standpoint. The only thing I'd add to that, in addition, when, when you talk about the hospice benefit, we are providing the durable medical equipment into your home, the pharmaceuticals that are related to your diagnosis, uh, the care, whether it's an aide or a nurse or the, the spiritual care or bereavement, social work. Um, all of that is encompassed in that benefit at a, a Part A description, so it's 100% covered. And also all of their medicine um, that is related to their hospice diagnosis. Um, you know, we get COPD patients um, mm -hmm. who, the, the you know, COP drugs, COPD drugs are very expensive drugs, and those are completely paid for. Anything that's related to their diagnosis, anything for pain, anxiety, nausea, um, anything related to their diagnosis. Briefs, um, I don't know if you've, had to buy any briefs lately, Jeff, but briefs are very expensive, right. so um, chucks um, to, to, to line their beds with, all right. those things are very expensive. All of those things are part of their benefit. So you I think the only thing I would add to that is also the treatments. You know, we talk about curative treatments as, as treatments that are not appropriate under the hospice benefit, but there are a lot of treatments that um, are considered um, palliative interventions that uh, people can continue to receive once they elect uh, their hospice benefit. So, you know, it's, it's not that folks have to discontinue and make dis dis choices to stop all of their chemotherapy or their radiation or, in some cases, even their dialysis. Those are difficult decisions to make. Some of those treatments may have, um, uh, you know, benefits to that patient that outweigh the burden of, of those treatments. And as long as they don't extend the prognosis beyond what is um, eligible under the benefit, then they are covered under the hospice benefit and those individuals can continue to receive those treatments. And I think that's a, 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 a common misperception of, of patients is they've got to stop, they're mm -hmm. giving up, um, they're not going to receive anything, and we provide very um, aggressive palliative interventions uh, right in the home for our patients. And yeah, that's, a, that's a really key point, too, because we hear that all the time. You know, is this going to cost me more right, money? Right. Uh, so to, to assume that, um, well, well, first of all, it, it, it seems almost antithetical that if you would discontinue treatments, it would cost more money, but that right. still is a bit of a myth there, that they, you know, there's some other alternative treatment or way of caring for them that is going to cost them money that isn't covered. I mean, it is a truly comprehensive benefit and it and it oftentimes relieves some of the financial burden that patients typically face as they go through the healthcare system. We are learning an awful lot tonight and I know the three three of you are going to leave us. <laughs> so, Jeff, thank you. Pleasure thank you. to have you on. Jason, you as thank well. You and of course, Cheryl, very nice to have thank you on you. as well. Uh, Michelle's going to stay with us. We're going to have a couple other folks join us and continue our discussion about hospice and end of life care. Our guests for the first part of the program have been Jeff Mislevy with Covenant Care, Jason Owen with Kindred at Home and Cheryl Hamilton also with Covenant Care. Michelle Carter, as I said, she'll continue to hang around with us and uh, we'll also be joined by Angela Bonacini from Covenant Care. Diane Rhodes will also join us. She's been a volunteer with both Covenant and Emerald Coast Hospice and Mark Smith, the uh, spiritual coordinator with Emerald Coast Hospice. You're watching in studio on WSRE television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. We're back in a moment. American Graduate is proud to recognize a champion for education. Our mission is to provide girls and young women an opportunity for a better future through education, counseling, training, and advocacy to enable them to become independent, empowered young women and productive members of our society. I didn't want to graduate. I was going to drop out, and then I came to Pace. Frequent discipline problems, uh, family issues that cost them to not be able to attend school regularly, so they had big gaps in their learning. I didn't used to like coming to school, but once I started coming to Pace, it really brought me out to love school. A lot of times we might be that student's confidence until she begins to see her successes and see that she really can accomplish everything that she's come here to do. But education is more than just the academics. It's being able to function in society and be successful there. And we see that with our girls and we love it. Now I'm being a leader instead of a follower. And I have people looking up to me to be the best person I can be. Pay Center for Girls is just a beautiful place to be because amazing things happen in the lives of the girls every day and we're here to celebrate it. Pace Center for Girls in Pensacola, a positive environment to help young women grow, achieve, and succeed.
For more stories of champions, visit americangraduate.org. You're watching in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. We're discussing hospice and end-of-life care. Michelle Carter from Emerald Coast Hospice is continuing to stay with us. We're also joined by three new guests. Mark Smith is the Spiritual Care Coordinator and Bereavement Coordinator for Emerald Coast Hospice. Mark has a Master's of Divinity from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. Prior to joining hospice, Mark was a youth minister and associate pastor. Diane Rhodes has been a volunteer with both Covenant Hospice and Emerald Coast Hospice. Diane spent 31 years with Navy Civil Service as a statistician, management analyst, and operations research analyst. These days, she spends time volunteering in patients' homes to give primary caregivers a break. Angela Bonacini has spent well over a decade with Covenant Hospice, serving in a variety of roles throughout the organization. Currently, she serves as Senior Director of Major Gifts for Covenant Care. Angela is also a registered nurse. I want to target this question to both of you. Books, both of you are nurses, registered nurses. Why did you get interested in hospice care? I was a nurse at the hospital, working on the floor. Um, very frustrated, I think, by my nursing career um, that I just couldn't spend the time. I felt like I just was running in and out of rooms. And I loved nursing. I loved taking care of patients. My uncle um, got sick with um, cancer, and I spent some time at the bedside with him. And when I told you earlier that I've seen death be a beautiful thing, it was a beautiful death. Um, he. Um, had all of his children around him. He was under the care of a hospice um, in, near my hometown, near Gainesville, Florida, um, and had all of his children there except one, his brother. Um, we were around his bedside for the whole evening while he got the medicine that he needed to keep him comfortable. And um, I was able to administer that medicine to, to give my cousin a break because mm -hmm. she had been doing that. And then I was able to take care of him um, clean him up, get him ready for the funeral home to pick him up once he had passed. And I watched his children and his brother carry him out of his home. Wow. And I thought, my gosh, this is a beautiful thing. This is a beautiful death. If death can be beautiful, this was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I knew in my bones that was exactly what I wanted to be, a hospice nurse. What about and you, Angela? Well, I started out an oncology nurse, so I saw the other side of everything possible that you would do and give to patients and what they went through. And then my father um, became ill with lung cancer. Mm. And oh, we had so many trips back and forth to the emergency rooms, and one of the oncologists came to me and said, Angela, it's time for hospice. And I said, don't you mention the word, and don't you mention it to him. And um, my father died in the ICU with strangers, with IVs and beeps and everything going on when had he been able to do it as he would have planned, he would have had opera music playing, he would have had his grandson in the bed, and he would have had pasta sauce cooking in the kitchen. <laughs> and he did not. And I knew after that that I had let the man I love the most down, that there was another way. Mm -hmm. And I went seeking that other way and found my life's work in hospice care over and over and over again. Mark, how did you come to hospice? Started with my grandmother. She had been on hospice and we went through that experience and they made it a really wonderful experience, the nurses that were there. Uh, but after that, I was in youth ministry and I uh, felt just the Lord leading me in a different direction. And a friend of mine called and said, you know, have you ever thought about being a chaplain with hospice? I had not. 
and, and just had talked about my gifts and, and, re, and affirmed me and said, why don't you call them? And uh, it has been a perfect match for uh, my calling in life and also my occupation. Diane, tell me your story. Well, I, like a lot of other people, thought hospice was called in like at the last moment, but my husband was sick. Uh, he had a terminal disease, and these people took care of him. Um, I had already begun when he was sick and no longer could be at home. I was volunteering for Covenant at the time. I was doing the office work, and I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, when I needed to spend more time with him, I saw them come in and out, and I'm going, they're here a lot. They come in and bathe them. They come in. Sometimes they would sit down and even help feed them. They would take care of them and just love on them, if you want to know the truth. Mm -hmm. um, make them smile, you know. Um, give them the dignity that sometimes gets robbed from them. Uh, so I saw all that going on. So it was about the last 10 months of my husband's life when they came in to, to my life. And then I began to have a little bit of free time and I would visit at another facility in the morning, a lady. And I was up with her till the end, you know. Mm -hmm. And I just enjoy it. My, having been a caregiver, my heart is with the caregiver. You get tired physically, you get tired emotionally. Uh, people like Mark come in and give you the best advice. They say, you know, you're talking about the talk. The talk my husband and I had years before when we knew we weren't going to call in, a, you know, mm -hmm. all those last minute machines to keep you breathing and, and right. those kind of things. So we were smart enough to do the advanced directives. We did the living will. We did the wills. We did the power of attorneys. Um, I worried about things after he got ill. What was going to happen to him if something happened to me? Right. We had no children. So I had to think about all those things. And Mark said also, even long before it was towards the end, he said, anything you can plan in advance, do it. Yeah. Now, nobody likes to think about that, but pre-planned funerals, um, and I did. It was hard for me to do, but I sat down and I wrote an obituary. Mm -hmm. I wrote, um, we had just moved back to Pensacola only about a year and a half before he got sick, and even the minister that was going to do his funeral didn't know him. Right. Um, so I wrote things about him and his life that I won't told, mm -hmm. and that was the only way he was ever going to know. Um, when my husband passed on a Friday, I had to hand, if I had not had the obituary written, by noon that day it had to go to the Pensacola News Journal or it wouldn't have been in there by Sunday, mm -hmm. you know. So, and you think you're ready, you're never ready. And at the last minute, you don't have to think, it's ready to go. So, my gift to other people is to be able to help them go through that process. If they're getting close to the end, I go into the home and I sit with, their loved one and that's such an honor to do and and you're like it's almost like you have to be interviewed first and now you don't blame people because you're walking into their homes and I tell them when the first time I said if you don't if you don't feel comfortable once you meet me leaving your loved one there with me let me know because you're not going to hurt my feelings because that person is important to you and it's just a real privilege to be able to do that kind of thing. Oftentimes, the caregiver is overlooked. Everyone focuses on the mm -hmm. patient, and there is so much stress mm -hmm. on the caregiver. But a lot of times, I have noticed caregivers don't want to move out of the way and take a break because the, the guilt thing. I, Mark, address that. Well, it's, it's their loved one. No one knows them like they do. No one mm -hmm. cares for them like they do. Uh, and they tend to overlook their own needs. They, they sacrifice because this person laying there can't do what uh, they used to could do for themselves. And so uh, we have to kind of come in very, very humbly, very cautiously and offer that support. And, uh, and we do that to, to, to let them know we're here. It's, they don't have to navigate this, mm -hmm. this strange area in life without some help and, and an area they've never been in before. And we, we develop a plan of care when we go in. You know, we sit down with those family members, find out what do you want, and what are, what are your plans, what are your goals, um, what do they want, if the, if the patient's still able to talk to us, and it's so nice when they are, so we can get to know them and find out what they want out of the whole situation. And then we develop a plan of care, and that plan of care is constantly changing. That nurse um, works with the family and the patient and the doctor, and the whole, um, we call it an interdisciplinary group team that has a chaplain, a social worker, um, uh, and the physician, and then of course the nurse. Um, and, and that is driven by what that family wants. And so we, we're guests in your home. Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't come in to take over, we come in to help you um, and to assist you 
in taking care of your loved one. And I think a lot of times that's a burden lifted. You know, we, we send health aides in to bathe if they need to be bathed. Um, if you've ever tried to bathe somebody in a bed, it's not an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy thing to do, but these people are trained. They're very well trained at what they do. And that they can be bathed as many times as they need to be bathed for that patient to feel comfortable and for that family member to feel comfortable. And we set a plan up for that. They get a social worker in the home. The social worker is gonna look at, at what are the needs of this family. They help them with planning, making those decisions ahead of time. Um, you know, and a lot of times they're not ready to make those decisions. Like, have you chosen a funeral home? I'm not ready to talk about that yet. Mm -hmm. So we keep that on our list of that's a very important thing to do. And we know when things start getting close, we need to, we need to press a little more because we need to make some decisions. Um, and the, um, then the chaplain offers the support. And, and like you said, a lot of times we're there as much for that family. Mm -hmm. um, and for that period of time after, a lot of times I feel like that is our ministry. Um, is to that family um, and to the patient. Now you want to add to that, Angela? Well, it's interesting. We have also in this community um, two hospice inpatient units. So when a patient can't be cared for at home anymore, for whatever reason, they meet a criteria of needing almost intensive care unit type hospice care. They come into our units. And our nurses will say, we can get those patients' pain and symptoms under control very swiftly. We have physicians there, nurse practitioners. That's very hypervigilant. The hard part is to care for those family members mm -hmm. who are suffering so much in that. So you really focus on them. You get the patient tucked in and, and in good shape. But then it becomes bringing everybody together from that IDG team to the patient's families, their children, their parents. Um, it, it's a very deep and rich benefit. Hospice is so much more. And you can come under hospice and we get you, we just had a, a beautiful situation like this. A fella came to us um, in his 50s, has ma malignant melanoma, had been worn down to 98 pounds from chemo, 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 and he couldn't eat. They, we put him inpatient, got his pain under control, his anxiety down, food in him, and he decided to go back for more treatment. So we get, hand them right back over to their oncologist, and they get their benefit back for that aggressive care, and then when they need us again, they'll come back to us. So we have graduates under hospice. And there's more than one level of care on hospice, so mm -hmm. Angela kind of brought up something. Um, while we don't have inpatient units, um, we do contract with facilities. We have 13 facilities that we contract with that we can move patients into for that mm -hmm. higher level of care. We call it general inpatient care. So, and that is a patient that is really, would be going to the hospital um, if, if need be to manage a symptom. But we also have something called continuous care or crisis care where we go into the home and take care of the patient at bedside. So if they're having a symptom that's uncontrolled, like something you would go almost go to the hospital for, like pain, um, nausea, respiratory, um, respiratory distress, mm -hmm. um, anxiety that's uncontrolled, that nurse will try to control that in the home, but if it gets to the level she can't, then we'll place a nurse at the bedside and that nurse will stay with that patient until we get that symptom under control. Um, we also have respite care. So this is something I think that's just not known. Mm -hmm. So when this family is stressed and tired, pneumonia, maybe they've gotten sick now and they can't care for that patient, Medicare pays for them to go to the hospital or to go to a place for five days where they're cared for for five days wow. to give them a break. And that doesn't cost that family anything. And then right. there's routine home care where we're just caring for them in the home and, and everything's as is. We're learning an awful lot this evening. Our conversation is about end of life care and hospice and we will continue talking with our wonderful panel of guests in just a couple of moments. You're watching in studio on WSRE television. BBS for the Gulf Coast. We are coming back in just a few minutes. The last time you needed to know there wasn't this or this. When the last hurricane hit our state, we were there. And today, we're still here, but we're also here. Introducing Florida Storms, a free mobile app from the Florida Public Radio Emergency Network, built just for Florida. 
With content from the National Hurricane Center and National Weather Service, Florida Storms will alert you to any weather hazard that may threaten you or your family. Florida Storms, download it today. Watching in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Our topic this evening, end of life care and hospice. We're joined by Michelle Carter of Emerald Coast Hospice, Angela Bonacini from Covenant Care, Diane Rhodes, who's been a volunteer with both Covenant and Emerald Coast Hospice, and also Mark Smith, the spiritual coordinator with Emerald Coast Hospice. What if you have a situation where perhaps a person doesn't have family or, in, or at least they don't have family in the area? How, how would you go about helping them out? So I'll, I'll probably speak yeah, to that better than Diane, yeah. but Diane, Diane is one that helps us with that. So a lot of times we'll have we'll get a call a, a call from a family member saying, you know, th this is the situation with my my loved one that's there, and I'm here, and I, and I need I need to pursue hospice care, or maybe they're in town and they've come in and they've just realized, oh my goodness, this has gotten bad. I've got to get some help from mom and dad. Mm -hmm. So once we get that referral for that family member from the family member re referral, the family member calls us, we can contact a physician and get an order, um, go out and assess that patient. We faxed consents away to people that aren't even here to get those people on service. And then we can take care of that family, uh, the, the patient here and contact that family member, let them know how things are going. A recent situation that, that um, Diane, um, we just this week um, we had a, a, a patient that was was going to pass alone. Um, there was not anybody going to be in, with them in the room, and the family member really didn't want mm -hmm. that to happen. So we have what's called an eleventh hour volunteer, um, and Diane is one of those eleventh hour volunteers. She, you never know when you're going to be called um, in the middle of the night um, or whatever, and. So she got a call um, and accepted that, and she was able to stay with that patient this past week. And I'll let her talk about that. Now, what's it like for you? What's it like for me? It's a privilege to be there with someone. It's, um, in, in this case, the family, I think, was exhausted. So they, they just didn't know, you know, I could have been there for four hours and nothing could have happened, but they didn't know. They just didn't know. As it turned out, I was there for three and the patient did pass. I was able to stay with them till a family member got there and our hospice own call nurse to do the follow-up. So to me, it's a privilege. It's something I would have wanted if I could not have been there for my loved ones. So to me, it's an honor. Mark, as a spiritual leader, what, what kind of advice do you give family members when, when you know the end is near? I mean, what, what, what's your advice? One thing we do is, is try and get them to, to make peace, uh, whether that is with relationships. If, there's someone they haven't contacted in a while, maybe to have them call in or to come by. Uh, we know our, our loved ones that are near end of life, uh, their hearing is still intact a lot of times, and so we encourage them to tell them they love them. Uh, we, we bring in spiritual interventions of prayer and playing music, just anything that would create an atmosphere of peace. And uh, we are a lot of times spend that time with those loved ones when we can. Uh, and it, it's just a beautiful thing. Sometimes it's, it's singing those hymns if they're Christians and have been in church and that's what you know, is, is important to them. And so we'll do that or we'll play music on YouTube, wh whatever it is, you know, we, we just provide what's gonna provide an atmosphere of peace. Angela, as far as staff is concerned, as far as the, the doctors and the nurses and all the folks, it takes a special breed, huh? It does. I, it's interesting though, one of the finest doctors that we had spent about 45 years as an OBGYN. Wow. And he came to us with that ability to innately understand and meet that person where they were. 
you know, he spent many, many nights up most of his life, and he would come in and be beside the nurse at the bedside and give meds to patients. It does take a special breed, but it takes a special heart. Um, most of all of our doctors are board certified in hospice and palliative care, so that is very extensive training that they have to do as well. Um, but once, I think, many different career paths can happen with a physician, but you see so much over that time that we all begin to understand more. It is about these last moments, and if those physicians can even retire into mm -hmm. a job where they can take all of that knowledge and all of the things that they know about mankind mm -hmm. and attend at the bedside, it is pretty amazing. Hospice nurses the same way. We can hire hospice nurses and they will self-annihilate in the first 30 days if they're not intended to be a hospice <laughs> nurse. Then they will stay with you for 25, 30, 35 years. Wow. There are times that it is so gut-wrenching and so emotionally involving that they'll come to you and they'll cry and they'll say, I can't do it again. They'll spend a few minutes and they come right back ready to do it again. Mm -hmm. Eleventh hour is a perfect, mm -hmm. um, a perfect example of that. And all of hospice says we don't want anybody dying alone. Mm -hmm. And if there's anybody, it's hospice people that mean that. And so it's going into nursing homes. It's going into jails. It's going under the bridges. It's going wherever that patient is and does take a real bit of commitment and love, but I'll tell you, hospice people can't imagine doing anything else. What would you recommend if well, someone wanted to be a volunteer? Well, I want to talk about okay. volunteering in general because not everybody's cut out to do the one-on-one -on -one with a patient okay. or the family, but there's so much more to volunteer for. I mean, I have stuff envelopes. I have data entry. You know, I have done all sorts of things, so please don't shy away forever volunteering from a hospice organization if you don't want to do deal with a patient and a family because there's a lot you can do. Mm -hmm. Even sales um, and marketing. Oh yeah, there's just, <laughs> there's just there's lots, lots and lots of things to do. So, and, and I'll tell you, it's a win-win situation. I feel good. I, I can't, you know, I, I get a wonderful feeling knowing I have helped somebody. Um, and, and so don't ever think you're not. I mean, you know, it's kind of like the starfish thing, you know, you know the starfish story Tell about us. the guy that walked the beach and all the starfish had washed up on the shore and they were dying and this man was throwing them back in one at a time. And somebody came up and said, why are you doing that? And he said, you possibly can't take care of all these. He said, no, but I helped that one. Oh, so every special. one you help, I mean, you know, we, we live in a world that's so crazy anyway. I mean, yeah. turn on the news, it's a mess. And you know, you do one thing at a time, one small step at a time. But yeah. volunteer, get involved. It, you know, it doesn't have to be hospice. I'm, I, you know, everybody should be involved in something. Give back. Gives you some purpose. My life experiences, I think, have helped me to do what I do. But not everybody has that. Not everybody's cut out to do it. Yeah. And you recognize that. We've got about five minutes, so we'll be a little bit tight on time. But what I do want to do here is, is hopefully we've educated our viewing audience. I know I've learned an awful lot tonight. I mean, you know, we, we hear about hospice, but we don't really understand the nuts and bolts of it all. So if, if a family is, is approaching a situation where they may need hospice, and I'll get both of you to address this because you're from Emerald Coast Hospice, you're from Covenant Care, um, what should they do? How do they go about contacting? How, how do I know who I contact? Well, you can call a, a local hospice, absolutely. You can pick up the phone and call us. Tell us your story and, and we'll point you in the right direction. Um, if you're under the care of a physician, you can ask your physician. Um, tell them where you're at and what your concerns are. But a lot of times, physicians are not ready. They're not ready to, to have that, that conversation with you. So, but a lot of times it goes different when the family approaches the physician, I think. And then that physician can write an order. All we need is a telephone call. That gets the ball rolling. And, and really, we can guide you from there. I think Angela would probably say, um, it, our, we have people trained on the other end of the line who will point you in the right direction. That's exactly how it goes. It's one phone call and the questions are minimal. We go to that patient and that family and we meet with them and just find out their goals and then we'll take it from there. At that point, they really don't have to do another thing. Just make the call and 
ask the questions because every single patient and family is assessed independently and everyone has different needs. So if all they need to do is talk to us and find out and be educated, that's what we do. If we need to admit them, we admit them then. We had a family that called us probably a year and, and I went and met with the family, saw the gentleman and I said, you know, he is right there, but he's not quite. But we'll, we'll keep touch of base with you and, and because you know the disease progression, you know what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And we followed up um, six months later, he was still right there. But a year later, it was absolutely time for hospice and we were there um, ready to help that family. We called, got the order, got in the home, got equipment in the home, and we were able to take care of him in his home until he passed. I am very short on time, but I just want each one of you just to leave me with a little 30 second um, remark on hospice and what it means to you and what people, what, what, what our viewers should understand about it. And I'll begin with you, Mark. Okay. I would say that uh, people ask all the time, how can you do hospice? And I would say, we celebrate life. That's, that's what hospice is about. Even though we're nearing the end of life, life is still to be celebrated, and that's our jobs. That's how and why we keep coming back, because we love to be there to help people celebrate life. I think having been a caregiver, you don't want to give up. Being an independent person, it's hard to ask for help, and a lot of people have a hard time with that. But once you let go and you let people help you, and that's what these people do, it, it makes life so much better. Michelle? I, you don't get a chance to do death over. I mean, you get one chance at death. A lot of things we can try again and again, but um, death is a one-shot thing. And um, I, I think it can be a beautiful death um, if it's done the right way. And um, I think we're experts at that. So um, I, I just think if you're, if you're even questioning um, where you're at, just give us a call and let us help you with that. I think I would sum up hospice as we are the promise keepers. We make sure that whatever your dream is to end the rest of your life, that we ensure that that will happen. We are there for your family, we are there for you, and we promise to make a difference. Well, I think you certainly have all made a difference this evening because I know on a personal level, I've learned an awful lot. I know that our viewers, I feel quite confident our viewers have learned an awful lot as well. Just real quick, your website is? Um, www.emeraldcoasthospice.com. Same, www.covenantcare.com. Okay, very good. What a real pleasure. Thank you for your service. Thank you so much for your service, and I know all the patients and family members must greatly appreciate you, and I know you're doing wonderful work. Thank, thank you. you. And thank both of you for your, as well. Thanks, and thank you so very much for watching our program. Our guests this evening have been Michelle Carter with Emerald Coast Hospice, Angela Bonacini from Covenant Care, Diane Rhodes, who has been an absolute pleasure to visit with this evening, who has been a volunteer with both Covenant and Emerald Coast Hospice, and Mark Smith, the spiritual coordinator with Emerald Coast Hospice. Earlier in the program, we were joined by Jeff Miss Levy from Covenant Care, Jason Owen with Kindred at Home, and Cheryl Hamilton also with Covenant Care. I'm Jeff Weeks. We greatly appreciate you spending some time with us this evening. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take wonderful care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Thank you for watching.